Thank you all so much for allowing me to come, and thank you for, uh, for the missions conference and for being uh, I'm concerned about missions and people around the world. I'm so thankful. Like, I grew up, um, from the time I was a little kid, I heard the gospel. You know, my mom was dragging me to church from the time I was born. And when I was eight years old, I was able to accept Christ as my Savior. And it's one of the greatest things in my life to know that forever, when I die, I'll spend eternity with Christ. And I know many of you have the same thing as, you know, you've accepted Christ your Savior. And we have a wonderful opportunity here that, that we can come and worship Christ. And we live in a country that's a free country where we can come and worship as we please. But, you know, there are people all over the world that will never hear about the gospel of Christ. to live their whole entire lives and never know. And uh, as Peter was talking about the villages in Africa and uh, people in Colombia and people in Chile and people all over the world will never, ever hear the gospel of Christ if we don't go tell them. So if you would turn with me to the book of Jonah, I'm going to uh, preach on a prophet tonight that was told to go witness to someone, was told to go tell people about, about God, was told to go tell them to repent, but he didn't really want to go. And we see in the scripture, and you probably know the story already, you know, a lot of things happened because he didn't go, but a lot of great things happened because he did go. So if you would turn with me to Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to read uh, verse number 1 all the way down through verse number 3. I know it's a long passage of scripture we're going to be reading, but bear with me. All right, so if we'll go to Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down unto it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, the missions conference. Dear Lord, thank you that... Um, we can serve you and worship you, dear Lord, and we can send missionaries around the world to tell people about you, dear Lord. And just thank you for the opportunity of giving us the opportunity to be able to work for you and tell people about you, dear Lord, and, and um, just do things for you, dear Lord. And I just pray that you be with me tonight as we speak, dear Lord, that you'll give me the words to say, dear Lord, and that um, uh, lives will be changed and that when we leave here, we'll be able, better able to worship you, dear Lord, and to tell people about you and to do your work, dear Lord, and be more motivated just to serve you, dear Lord. In your name, amen. amen. Now, I remember when I was like, I think I was around 13 or 14 years old, uh, my dad, he went down around the corner. My dad, I grew up in a preacher's home, so my dad was a pastor, and um, he went down around the corner about three blocks from my house in Parsons, Kansas, and he went to the store called AT&T, and I was pretty, I didn't really know much about this company, AT&T, you know, I didn't know much about it at all because I'm only, you know, 13, 14 years old, but he went down there and he bought this device called a cell phone. And I remember him coming back with this device on his belt, you know, and you had to have a belt to wear it because if you didn't, you know, your pants would fall down. It was so heavy and it didn't really look like any cell phone I, I have seen, you know, since then, but it almost looked like a, you know, one of those big red bricks that you carry around, you know, like he clipped it on his belt and, you know, his pants sagged a little bit, but, you know, he had this cell phone and I was like, man, my dad is the coolest dad in the world. I was like, before this, I was like, doctors and lawyers had cell phones, and you know, the president probably had a cell phone, but now my dad has a cell phone. And I was like, man, my dad is the coolest dad in the world, hands down. Like, this guy has a cell phone. And I remember being so excited about it, and you know, then later on I turned, I was 17, and my friend who had just turned 18 went and got a cell phone, and from the same AT&T store, and I was like, Mom, can I get a cell phone? I was like, I'm 17, I'm almost 18, like, let me get a cell phone. And my mom was like, no, no 17-year-old kid needs a cell phone. Like, you'll be awake all night talking to who knows who, you know, all night long talking to, you know, whoever, your friends and stuff, staying up, you were not getting a cell phone. So I was a little bum, so I waited until I was 18. Because you know, once you turn 18, you're an adult. You can do whatever you want. No matter what your parents say, like, I'm like, I'm an adult now, I can get a phone. So I snuck down to the AT&T store, and you know, I had a job now, and I had my own money, and so I got a cell phone. And I didn't tell them about it for the longest time, but eventually they found out. My sister told on me. So anyways, they found out, and you know, she wasn't too mad about it. But I was pretty stoked about this cell phone. I mean, once they found out, I was like, man, now everybody can know that this guy has a cell phone. And I remember I used to always wear the construction pants, you know, with the belt loop down here that you put a hammer in, which never really works. It always hits your leg when you try to climb a ladder. Makes no sense to me, but I remember getting that cell phone, and I'd clip it on my, on my nail pocket, and I made sure it was on the outside where everyone could see that this guy right here, this guy, 
He's very important. He has a cell phone. Like, he's almost up there with the president. And I remember wearing that thing around, and I'd always leave it loud where if it rang, everybody could hear, except in church, because I'd get in trouble. But I remember leaving it, you know, loud, as loud as I could get, so every time it rang, everybody's like, oh, man, this guy, he's getting a phone call. Someone wants to talk to him. Nobody really ever called me, but I felt really cool when it rang. But, I mean, I felt so cool with my cell phone. But now it's like, you know, 15 years later, and I still have a cell phone, and when it rings, I'm not really that excited about it when it rings. And most of the time, when I carry my cell phone around, I put it on silent. I even turn the vibration off because I don't want to hear it. And I put it in my pocket, and someone could call me all day long. Unless I look at it, I never even know. Or sometimes I look at it, and I see, and I know who's calling. I hear it ring, and, and I see who's calling. I'm like, I don't know if I want to answer this call. I don't recognize it. Or, you know, I have a sister that she'll call every once in a while. And unless I have, like, two solid hours I just want to waste in a conversation learning nothing and not say one word, then I might answer it. But usually that's not the case. Or, you know, we've all gotten the call where someone calls like, would you like to extend the warranty on your car? And every time I get that call, you know, before I bought my car for deputation, I had an old Toyota T100. I mean, it was sold. The Tacoma hadn't even come out yet. And I had over 200,000 miles. I'm like, man, if you'll sell me a warranty, I'll take it. But, you know, we get calls all the time, maybe from your, your family, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, or your kids in college and they need money, or, you know, your grandkids. I mean, we get calls all the time. But many times when we get the call, either our phone's on silent and we're too busy to hear it, or we look at it and we see the number and we're like, no, I already know what they want. I don't want to answer it. And we put it on silent or we hang up and we put it back in our pocket. But many times, God calls us to do something. Just like he called Jonah in the book of Jonah. He told Jonah, rise and go. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to answer that call. I'm going to run the other way. And I just imagine Jonah, you know, when, when God called him. And when I first read this, I'm like, man, Jonah is a, a terrible prophet. And I remember growing up preaching, and, you know, I heard the sermon of Jonah many times. And I always remember thinking, like, man, Jonah was a lousy prophet. He is a good-for-nothing prophet. Like, he, there are people that needed to be saved, that God told him something to do. And he's like, nope, not going to do it, and ran the other way. But I just imagine Jonah, when I started reading through there, and I just imagine Jonah, you know, he's over in, bear with me, my, my imagination is quite big, but I just imagine Jonah, you know, he's over in his Hebrew land, hanging out with his Hebrew friends, and, you know, he's probably in his, his tent, and he's got his favorite lazy boy that he likes to recline on on Sunday, and you know, he's probably got his couple camels outside, and if it was me, I'd name my camel, you know, Ferrari or Lamborghini or Corvette or something, but I just imagine Jonah being over here, you know, and he, he's comfortable in his life. And God says, Jonah, I want you to rise, and I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to tell these wicked, wicked people over here that don't know their left hand from their right hand, they don't know right from wrong, I want you to tell them to repent, so that one day when they die, they might be able to go to heaven. And Jonah's like, no, I don't want to do it. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about when God was calling me to be a missionary to Columbia. And you know, I was living in San Diego at the time, and I was thinking of all these things. I'm like, Lord, it's comfortable here. Like, I have a house, and it's only three miles from the ocean, and it's three miles from Mexico. I can go get tacos anytime I want, and, which is the best part of San Diego. And, you know, I was like, I have my church I go to, and I enjoy it. And, you know, Lord, you're calling me to go to another country where I don't speak the language. I don't know the culture. I don't know the people. And where am I going to get money from if I leave my job? And all these other things. And I started thinking just like Jonah, like, I don't want to go, Lord. I don't want to go. And I wanted to serve the Lord. And I imagine Jonah in the Bible wanted to serve the Lord. I mean, he was a prophet of God. He was a man of God. He was a man that God called to do great things for him. And I felt just like Jonah in a way, like, Lord, I, don't, I want to do what you want me to do, but it's, causing, it's going to cause me some discomfort, Lord. But every single one of us in this room have been called to do something of God. And it may not be going to Nineveh. It may not be going to Colombia or Chile or Africa or wherever it is. But God has something for every single person here. And I was reading through it, I was thinking like, man, God has something for Joni, He has something for me. He has something for your pastor. He has something for all the missionaries. He has something for every single person. It starts, as the theme says, it starts with us. It starts with you. It starts with me. We all have something that God has for us to do. And it may start with just something simply as grabbing a handful of tracks when you leave church. And when you go throughout the city and you go through into your grocery line that you hand them a track or give them a gospel track that tells them how they can have eternal salvation just like you and just like me. It may start with just praying. Praying for your pastor, praying for the missionaries, 
praying for the people in your church, the deacons, the ushers, praying for people in your church that you know are struggling. Or it may be giving. You know, the Bible tells us all through the Bible, but talks about tithes and offerings. It may be that God is saying, hey, maybe you should give more. Or maybe you should give the 10% that we should give. Or maybe you should give more to missions so that people around the world can accept the gospel of Christ. Amen. I think over in Matthew where it says, uh, in the last, last verse of Matthew where it says, you know, go ye into all the world, uh, verse number 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. God gives us right there the Great Commission. We're supposed to tell everyone about Christ. That means people in our neighborhood, people in our city, people all over our country, people all over the world. And he also gives us the Great Commandment to love the Lord thy God first and to love your neighbor second. And you know, you can't love God without telling people about, about Christ and what he's done in your life. And you can't love your neighbor or your other people without wanting to tell them about Christ. I mean, the two go hand in hand, the two greatest things in the Bible. God has something for every single one of us to do. You know, whether it's to witness to someone, to give, to pray, or just serving in the church. I think of growing up, you know, with my parents, and, you know, my, every time we'd have a meeting or we'd have church, you know, my mom and dad worked tirelessly to prepare everything. And I never realized how much work goes into, you know, just getting one service ready. My dad would write down the schedule for this church. You know, my mom would clean the church and all the work that goes into that. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into having a church service and people being able to come, being able to, to worship Christ and being able to hear about the gospel in church. And maybe the Lord is calling you to serve more in the church, to come and help clean the church, or maybe mow the grass, or maybe it's teaching a Sunday school class, or being an usher or a disciple. There is something in church that all of us can do, something for all of us to do in church to help serve. But many times, God has something for us to do. And I think of all the different things, you know, that I've done in church and everything. God has something for all of us to do. But many times we have excuses just like Jonah. When I was reading through Jonah, you know, thinking, man, he's a bad prophet. I started reading about Nineveh. And I started reading how, how wicked and terrible Nineveh was. Nineveh wasn't just a regular city where it's like, oh, you can go there and do things and whatever. It was a wicked, wicked city. It was one of the most wicked cities of that day. I mean, it was so wicked. It says their wickedness came up before God above all the other cities. And I started reading about Nineveh and how they would go in and they would just completely destroy areas and cities and they would put people in buildings and maybe burn the buildings down or other things where they would wrap people in leather and get the leather wet and as the leather slowly dried, it would suffocate the people to death. And I remember reading about the Ninevites and how wicked and evil they were and you know, I started reading about Jonah and how he's like, they deserve, they don't deserve your grace, they don't deserve your love, Lord. And I started thinking, man, who would think that? Who would think that someone else is lost and I don't even care. I want them to not repent. I want them to spend eternity in hell. But you know, after reading about the Ninevites and how evil and wicked they were and how much they didn't like the Hebrews or Christianity, I started realizing, man, Jonah had some good reasons not to want to go to Nineveh. And I started thinking about my own life and maybe you can think in your life is, what if God called you to go to Afghanistan or Iraq and be a missionary to ISIS or the Taliban? It would be almost equivalent to Jonah going to Nineveh. I mean, we know the Taliban and ISIS and those guys, they hate Americans. They also hate Christianity. And I remember 9-11 when it happened and the, the airplanes flew into the towers and watching the people jump from the top floor and fall all the way down to the bottom and die. And the people that would run with pure terror in their eyes away from the buildings collapsing. And whenever that happened, I thought in my mind, I was like, man, let's go to war. Let's get them. Let's make a parking lot out of their, out of their country. But you know, I imagine that's probably what Jonah was thinking, probably the same thing. He's probably no different than you or different than me. But you know, the Taliban and ISIS, they deserve the grace of God just as much as we do. Amen. None of us deserve the grace of God right, right. any more than they do. But yet, and I hope the Taliban, I hope every single person of ISIS gets saved. But you know, there are people all over the world that need the gospel. And I think of those excuses and I was thinking of that and then even my own excuses in my own life is, you know, I was going to church in San Diego and I was working in everything. I'd go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night because I, I love going to church. I mean, I just love being there. If they had a work day on Saturday, I'd go or visitation and everything. But, and I worked, you know, I'd count the money and I'd worked with the youth and all kinds of different things. But I remember they kept asking me like, Chesley, will you be an usher? 
And I was like, man, I don't really want to be an usher. And there's really only one reason I didn't want to be an usher. Because to be an usher in the church, you had to wear a tie. And I hate wearing ties. But I was thinking, that was my excuse for not being an usher. It was nothing compared to Jonah's excuses. You know, I'm thinking of the excuses we have all the time of, oh, I don't want to hand out a tract to someone. Maybe I forgot them. Or maybe if I hand them out to them, maybe they, they won't like me. Or they're never going to come to church anyways, even if I hand them out one. Or if I hand it to them, they're going to throw it away, and it's just going to be a waste of paper. Or I don't want to serve in church, and I don't want to um, clean, because I don't have the time to come to church and do things like that. Or maybe I don't want to teach a Sunday school class, because, man, getting in front of people and talking to people, that makes me scared and makes me nervous. And I remember when I was uh, preparing to be a missionary, I was like, man, the worst thing in the world for me was to stand up in front of people and talk to people. I mean, I was terrified of it, especially, you know, Robert's the one that, you know, trained me a little bit in preaching. And man, whenever I'd go preach in front of him, I was like, oh, man, I was nervous. I mean, it's scary to get up in front of people and talk to people. But we have to, because if it's what God's told you to do. I mean, God has something for every single one of us to do. But we all have excuses why we can't do it. But you know, Despite Jonah's excuses, despite him not wanting to go to Nineveh, he still had a huge effect on the Ninevites. He still had a huge effect in that time. And I was thinking how Jonah, you know, um, God called him to go to Nineveh, and he was going, and he didn't want to go, so, you know, he went down to the ship, and he got aboard the ship, and they're sailing out to Tarsus, and, you know, I just imagined him getting on that ship, and the, the sailors in that day, and I just imagined the sailors in that day, you know, they were like burly, rugged men. They weren't like guys now on boats, you know, or ships that have engines and, you know, they can just, you know, push the throttle forward and they go like, these guys were like, you know, pulling the sails up and all kinds of stuff and rowing the boat. And I just imagine these guys being like some of the toughest men in the world, you know, like their arms are probably like, you know, as big as my torso and they probably, you know, had tattoos or something. I don't know. But I just imagine these guys being like huge, massive, like Viking men and Viking ships, like ready to go, you know, out to sea at any time. And I just imagine Jonah, he goes and he gets on that ship and, you know, they head out to sea and Jonah's like, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. And they head out to sea and, you know, the storm comes up and I just imagine it, you know, like the, the waves are as big as a ship. And I just think of the times, you know, when I was in the Navy and I worked on a minesweeper and it was only 200 feet long, which is a really big bass boat, but a very small Navy ship. And it was made out of wooden fiberglass so the you know, the mines wouldn't blow it up. But I remember sometimes being on that ship and, and the waves would come up and, you know, sometimes they're like as high as this building and you, I would just be standing there with both my hands on the helm, like gripping it, you know, and trying to keep the course. And uh, I'd be praying and be like, Lord, if you help us make it through the storm, like I will read the book of Proverbs every day for the rest of my life. Or I'll read my Bible every day for the rest of my life. Lord, if you help me make it through, like I will serve you forever and I will never do anything wrong again. I remember thinking, you know, I know you guys are probably more spiritual and don't make deals with God like that. But I remember just thinking like, Lord, please help us make it through this storm. But when these guys were out at sea, they were thinking the same thing. They were like, Lord, please help us make it through this storm. They're like, who here has done wrong? And they find Jonah, you know, just hanging out, you know, in the bottom of the boat, you know, probably taking a nap. And so they throw Jonah overboard and he goes overboard and the whale swallows him. And I just can't imagine, you know, he didn't want the Ninevites to be saved so bad that he sat in the belly of a well for three days. And he sat down there, and I remember growing up, we'd go catfishing all night and come home, and my dad would fillet all the catfish and put them in a bucket, and then me or my brother would have to go bury the fish. And normally it was like an argument over who had to go bury him, who didn't have to go bury him, because it was a stinky job. But I remember I'd go bury the fish sometimes and a day later a dog or a cat or something or a wild animal would come and dig them up and you could start smelling the stink of them. And I just imagine Jonah being in the belly of the well and that stench and that mire and that muck of disobedience and running from God. And he didn't want to obey God so much that he was willing to sit there for three days until he finally got spit up. But then finally we see where God tells Jonah to go again in chapter number 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And Jonah finally got up, and he went to Nineveh, and he walked through the city, and he told them they needed to repent. And in verse number 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. And we go down to the very last verse in the book. 
And it says, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. You know, Jonah finally got spit up by the whale. He finally went to Nineveh. And I imagine him going to Nineveh, kind of like when my mom would tell me to clean my room. And it's like, I really didn't want to clean my room at all. So I'd put my hands in my pockets, you know, and like stomp to my room and go in and clean it up and make a lot of noise while I was doing it and grunting, you know, because I didn't want to clean it. But the punishment from my mother from not cleaning my room was worse than actually cleaning my room. But I just imagine Jonah, you know, going to Nineveh and he just walks through the city and he just, you know, just says, repent, God's going to destroy you in 40 days. And the entire city repented. I mean, it says in verse number 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. When Jonah finally did what God told him to do, despite his bad attitude, there was a huge revival in Nineveh. And many people repented and knew God. You know, God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. He finally went, despite all his excuses, despite the reasons he didn't want to go, and the Lord did a miraculous thing. You know, I was thinking of a story that my mom told me a while back. And she told me the story of a little girl that was sitting on the side of the road in, in Illinois. And she was sitting on the side of the road with her head in her hands. And she was just praying, saying, Lord, please send me someone that can take me to church. Yeah. And this same little girl, she had grown up in Illinois. And um, her dad and her mom were married. But her dad was an alcoholic and would come home and would completely beat on her mom. And would beat on the kids, and when the two boys tr would try to stop the dad, he would beat them. And sometimes he would come home and put all the kids in the car and drive around, putting all their lives in danger. And many times the mom, if she knew the dad was out drinking, would try to call the police so that he'd get arrested and spend a night in jail before he came home and he was sober, and she would get by a day without being beat. And that's the home this little girl grew up in. Up in. And finally, their mom and dad had gotten divorced, and, and the mom was a single mom with, you know, two boys and two girls in Florida, and she was growing up, and uh, the grandmother lived in Illinois, and finally the grandmother was like, you need to move with your kids up to Illinois. And of course, the mom, single mom, four kids, I mean, it was extremely difficult for her. So she moved to Illinois, where the grandparents were. But the great thing is, this little girl, many years before, while they were living in Florida, had been able to walk down the street to a Nazarene church and accepted Christ as her Savior. And I know there's many things that I wouldn't agree with the Nazarenes on that we wouldn't agree with the Nazarenes on. But the one thing is she's able to go to this church and, and accept Christ for by grace through faith, and she was saved. And she's able to walk to that church every single Sunday and every single Wednesday and go to church. But now that they moved to Illinois, there was no church close by that she could go to. And so she kept asking her mom to take her to church, and her mom would say, no, I'm too busy, or I have to work. And she'd go to her grandmother and ask, can you take me to church? And her grandmother would say, no, I'm too busy, or I have to work. And so finally the girl one Sunday had asked her mom, and her mom had said no, and she was walking to her grandmother's house to ask her grandmother to take her to church. And she sat down on the side of the road and was just praying, saying, Lord, please send me someone that can take me to church. And at that same time, there was a lady driving down the street named Miss Conway, they stopped and saw this little girl and said, what are you doing on the side of the road? You're way too young to be out here by yourself. And of course, the little girl kind of opened up and said, I just want someone to take me to church and told her a little bit about her home life. And so Miss Conway said, well, I can take you to church. I go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and I'll pick you up and take you to church. And so Miss Pat Conway started taking this little girl to church every single service. And then Pat Conway came over to the girl's house and was trying to witness to her mom and trying to witness to her grandmother. And um, they didn't accept Christ at the time. But in the course of the conversation, Pat Conway said, well, can this little girl come and live with me after realizing the situation that she was in? And the, mom, the little girl's mom said, sure, she can go. And the, grand, the grandmother was OK with it. And you know, the little girl, despite the fact that she wanted to go to church and wanted to go to Pat Conway's house and live with her, she still felt a little rejected that you know her mom would just let her go live with someone else. But the great thing is she went to live with Pat Conway. She went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then at the Baptist church that Miss Pat Conway went to, they had, a, they had a Christian school where the little girl was able to go to school every single day to a Christian school. And she grew up and she graduated from that school and then went to Bible college. And while in Bible college, that girl met my dad. And they moved to Parsons, Kansas. And I think of all the people growing up that my mom was able to influence in Parsons, Kansas, 
I remember every Saturday morning we'd get up and we'd get in a van and it would be hot outside, but we're all, you know, sweating in the van, driving around. And my mom would visit every single bus kid that came on the bus to the church and tell their parents about the, the gospel of Christ. And she loved those bus kids because my mom came from that exact same situation. And I think of the impact that she had on all those kids in Parsons, Kansas, but the impact she had on my life and all my brothers and sisters' lives, and the impact on every single person I've ever been able to witness to was because of my mom. And every single church that's able to be started in Columbia, and every single kid that's able to come to know Christ in Columbia, it can be traced back to fruit from my mom's account. But really it goes back before that to Miss Pat Conway who she was driving down the road one day and she wasn't too busy on her way home from church to make dinner. She wasn't too busy on her way home to, to sit in the recliner and prop her feet up and take a nap. She wasn't too busy to, to go and take care of her kids or to see her husband. But she had time when God said, hey, go and talk to that little girl. See, what, see what's wrong with her. That she took the time to stop and talk to her. And the influence that one decision made on Parsons, Kansas, and on mine and my, my own life, on the people I've been able to witness to and my brothers and sisters have, on my dad's life and be able to be a pastor in Kansas, and all the people in Columbia's lives. Because one lady, when she was driving down the road, said, oh, it starts with me. I need to stop and talk to this lady. I need to stop and talk to this little girl. And I think when Jonah went to Nineveh, you know, it started with him. God said, Jonah, I want you to rise and I want you to go to Nineveh and tell those people that they need to repent. And despite Jonah's attitude, he went and he had a huge impact. And I think of Pat Conway driving down the road and stopping and talking to that little girl. She never knew the impact she would have on the world, but she, she had a huge impact. And you know, you and I have the same opportunity every single day that Pat Conway has. I mean, we may never see the thousands in a whole city repent and, and come to know Christ because, you know, we walked through the city for two days and, and told them to repent. We may never see that. And Pat Conway may never see the, the churches that are started in Columbia or people saved in Columbia. She may never see people that are saved in the United States. Pat Conway doesn't know any of the people that were saved in Parsons, Kansas because of my mom. But we all, every single one of us, have the same opportunity. You know, there's someone somewhere that we know that needs Christ. There are people that you know that I will never, ever meet. People that you know that your pastor will never meet. People that you know that the person sitting next to you will never meet that we can tell about Christ. And they may be someone that has a huge impact on the world for Christ. And we may never see the results. We may never, never know the results. But it starts with each and every single one of us when we go through our lives looking for someone to witness to, looking for God when He calls. And when He calls and He says, hey, witness to that person, tell that person about Christ. Do we answer the call? Or do we just kind of put the phone back on silent and put it in our pocket? Or do we say, Lord, it doesn't start with me. Someone else can tell them about Christ. So I just want to challenge you as we go out. There's a world out there that needs the gospel. Once you leave the United States, there are millions of people that need the gospel. Inside the United States, there are millions of people that need the gospel. But it starts with every single one of us. When God calls, answering that call. Pastor. It starts with us. Amen. Thank you for that challenge, brother. Well, let's stand if you would and uh, get your blood flowing a little bit as our next preacher gets ready.